Welcome guys to the All Ears podcast with myself, Luke Barnett. I have started this podcast selfishly because I'm trying to suck out all the information in the world. As a, you know, When I started mixed martial arts, I understood very, very rapidly that when I stepped onto the mat, the more I learned about mixed martial arts, the less I actually knew because there's so much to it. And you feel like you'd start to learn something and then you'd open this next bit, this next bit, this next bit, and you'd have so much to learn. And then I retired from fighting and I went into the business world and the same happened there. I like left the little fighting world and then I went into the big wide business world and I started to ask questions and I thought I knew everything and then it turned out I knew nothing. So the, you know, the more I was learning, the less I actually knew. So I've selfishly started this to try and get guests on to talk to about every type of business, every type of lifestyle, every walk of life so I can learn. And through me learning, hopefully you guys too. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. We've got a fantastic episode today. Um, let's get going. Dan, welcome. So we're going to start off. What's harder, becoming a bare knuckle boxing world champion or growing up in Wales? Oh, that's a tough question. I think when I go back to my childhood, unfortunately, that my childhood was, was not great. You know, my, my role models were heroin addicts and alcoholics. So for me growing up in that, uh, me growing up through that as a child, that's, I got to see many things and many things happened to me that no child should ever go through. So I was brought up through the foster care system, lived in hostels, lived in with people who didn't really care about me, even though they were better homes than I, than I was brought up in. And then also, you know, understanding that the attachment to my mum, that I loved her, but I understand that she was ill. But as a, at that young age, you don't understand that. You just see someone putting you in life-threatening uh, situations and seeing things that you should never or ever go through. You know, I used to you know, save my mother's life every day because she would get so drunk that she'd swallow her tongue. The house would catch on fire. I'd have four houses catch on fire when I was a kid. You know, it'd be people in my home. I'd be walking around needles, bottles of methadone, you know, and then my stepfather, you know, on the other side, that how my mum became that. Also, that, that you know, the, the domestic abuse, you know, the, the violent behaviours from him. Uh, obviously, then he would take that out on me as a young child. Like, me, I'm a small guy, you know, so when I was little, I looked like Mowgli, you know, <laughs> so, uh, like, for me, you know, the violence that was shown was absolutely horrific. And but from what age was that? What, when you from say? the age of three to the age of uh, 10, 11, um, like, the likes of just, I used, to get, I used to get beat with a metal side of the belt every day, you know, and I used to laugh in his face because I just wouldn't show that he could hurt me. Then the next day I can sit down for a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's little marks on my ass from it, like you know. But what I'm trying to say is, is like going through those behaviours and from other people that you had no control of when you were a child was, like you said, again, it's horrific because you have no control of that. And social services back in them days, <laughs> they weren't as on it as they are today. Mm -hmm. Things, a lot more things happened years ago, you know, and. The sad thing is that you still have the attachment to love your mum because I was in her stomach for nine months, you know, um, and I was hoping that she'd get better. Um, so I was in and out of foster care all the time, going to different homes. And then there's a time in your life where you became, well, I became a broken child. So, you know, birthdays, Christmases, you get all these promises. Oh, you know, you, dad, you baby, you're going to have this, you're going to buy this for you. But my mum was... was that these people, alcoholics and drug addicts, are very smart. Mm -hmm. They keep their foot in the door. They turn up to the twice a month lack review while I'm getting looked after by somebody else. So they know when it comes to the age of 16, they hope that child will come back and look after them while they still take drugs. So I'd still take alcohol. It'd be me who'd be putting bread and milk in the cupboards in the fridge, you know? So, and I could see growing up through foster care how that happened with my other f foster brothers and sisters. The vicious circle was the child always had the attachment to the parent because social services didn't step in for adoption quick enough. Then our child will always have that attachment with the parent, doesn't matter what it's been through. So when it gets to the age of 16, they're entitled to go back home or have their own little independent flat. They have help, they have funding mm -hmm. for that. Nine times out of the ten, they go back to try and fix the parents. Mm -hmm. And then the parents hasn't, the, the child hasn't got the capability to do that at 16 years of age. It's still a child that hasn't had a childhood. So when they are trying to look after mom, put food and uh, drink in the cupboards and the fridges, then there's only so much that child can do. And then all of a sudden the child becomes the parent. Yeah. Do you understand? So sadly, that's what happened. And I could see this happening growing up. And 
when I got to the age of, I think I was 12, my mum went to prison. Mm. Uh, she got convicted of stabbing someone. Okay. Uh, she was in a woman's prison up in Liverpool or something like that. It was just quite far away for four years, the time was. Um, and in that time, I had hope because I knew that my mum, when she was in jail, I knew she'd be clean and sober. Ah, She's okay. away from the world. This is the perfect time for her to sort her life out. Accept professional help. Be honest with herself and uh, accept that she, she needs that help. Um, and, and we did. I had thousands of letters in those years. She was in jail. And when I went, I went to a really good foster home at the age of 11, 12. Mm -hmm. So the time my mum was in jail, this was the actual first foster home that actually loved me like their own child. But I couldn't love them back at the time because... I still have attachment to my mum. And these foster parents were unbelievable. They were like, you know, they taught me how to eat my food. <laughs> you know, they taught me, you know, manners, respect. You know, I had a curfew, you know. I had to be in at the age, you know, I had to be in by six o'clock before it got dark. That was never heard of. I was robbing schools when I was <laughs> six, seven years of age. I was trying to be with the big boys, yeah. you know, because it's it just a mechanism of surviving. You know, I, do what I have to do what I have to do. But, I mean... But in that time, I had thousands and thousands of letters off my mum, promises. And I've all, I was already heartbroken by them from the things I, that I was going through and the trauma that came after that. And then I came really close to this foster family and I really, I did, you know, I could see what they do doing for me. They, they, they changed my whole life, but I still was attached to my mum. But the final break of me where, to get where I am right now was the day my mum came out to jail then, she phoned me and she was drug, drunk and full of drugs. And that was the day I said to my foster parents, I said, this is the day that you become my mum and dad. I said, and now I can love you. And now I can accept the love that you give me back. Because before I couldn't accept that. Because again, my attachment was my mum. Mm. But even from that age, 11, 12 years of age, I could make such a mature decision. I had to cut off what was toxic, and I was her. I knew that if I had her still in my life, that I was going to become that, or dead or in jail. And how long from that from that moment where you decided to cut her off, you continued with your foster family, with that, that foster family? Well, the most important thing was that they, accept, they, they, uh, they accepted my decision. They could have said, no, Dan, you know, that's your mum, etc. But they, they, they allowed me, they, they respected my decision. So I did. I, on that day onwards, I didn't speak to her. I cut all ties. Mm -hmm. And no one could believe it. And that's not because I'm a bad person. But this person, I realized then, was just a name on a birth certificate. At that age, I needed someone to, su to support me. Basic needs. Feed me. Roof over my head. Take me to school. You know? mm -hmm. uh, before that, I had none of that. And many th worse things than that was happening. So when I came to making that decision, look, was that I knew I was going to have trauma after that. And I, I knew I was in a good place to expose that trauma because I had good people around me. So my foster parents then obviously were taken back that I made that decision, but they respected it. But at that time, all, I, all a child needs is love. So... That's what they give me, and I accepted it. Mm -hmm. So moving forward then, dealing with the traumas of my past, they could understand, you know, I, I was having nightmares, I was having, I had twitches, you know. Um, it was many things, that I, I had trust issues, of course. I didn't, you know, um, but the most important thing was I was still somehow a happy kid. But the thing that I was struggling to understand is when I was growing up was, was I going to carry the defect from my parents? You know, was I going to carry that gene of having addictions? Also, was I going to carry that trauma through my new friendships and relationships as I was growing up? But my foster parents done a fantastic job. You know, they, they took me on holidays. They cared for me. They showed me love. You know, they showed me how to make friends. Um, well, mainly, they, they showed me how to love again and trust. So going through that process as a young child, I was still worrying, like, is this trauma going to catch up to me as I was growing up? And then that's when I come into the sport of boxing. You know, um, for me was, I was football crazy when I was young. Uh, but then unfortunately, my foster dad passed away. And he was the rock of the family. Mm. Like, you know, he carried the, our whole family. So, when he passed away, it was a heavy loss. 
And what age were you when that happened? I was 13. I was right. like 13. So it was only, I'd been in his life three years. So 10, 12, yeah, 13, 14. Right. And that was a huge shock to the family because it was sudden. And he said to me, if he ever, want, if he ever wanted a son, he wanted it me to be like him. It was him. So I was gutted that after he passed away, that was another trauma of losing something so important in my life. So when then I got into boxing, he wasn't there. But mm. I knew he would support me that. So in my head, I was just like, I'd do this for him, like, you know. But I know he, he would have respected that. So, yeah, you know, I got into boxing then. And um, it was mad because I got into boxing. Where I was from, there hadn't been a boxing gym in 50 years. <laughs> 50 years. So I was born, I was brought up in a valley called Blind Winvy. So, you know, we had nothing up there. You know, but we was children in the 90s days. We didn't have technology. <laughs> you know, uh, we just had a football in our hand. And you would lucky to get us in to eat our, dinner, uh, eat our evening meal. You know, because we were, we would play up in the woods. We played bulldogs. We, uh, we was proper kids then. You know, I was the first time I could really live my life as a child. So when I got into boxing then, I realized then that I had a fantastic boxing co- coach called John Radmore. And he taught me solid basics, you know. He was a great coach. And again, he was like, a, he played that dad figure when yeah. my foster dad had, disip- had, had passed away. And he came a huge impact on my life because when a boxing club first opened, there's 60, 70 kids. Then it slowly narrows down to three to ten children. <laughs> it could be ten, it could be three, it could be zero, it was, you know. And I realized I was really fast. <laughs> and I started boxing. I had no boxing in my family. You know, I, I did have a hard life growing up as a child. I was always fighting. I just remember I was the only black kid in my school, mm. or Pakistani kid, as, as I was called. I got called loads of names. I was bullied all the time. You know, I was unnutritioned as a kid. Because you can imagine, I'm small now, but I was really small when I was young, you know. But I wouldn't care if I win or lose. I'd fight you until I get your respect. Mm-hmm. And I was just born that way. You know, if I had a funny stomach in my feeling, fit feeling a, a funny feeling in my stomach, I'd go. I, I wasn't afraid of nobody when I was a kid. I faced worse things than this, you know, than someone trying to bully me. You know, I faced way worse things than this. I felt, I don't know, I faced a man beating me every day. You know, so this was like, you, you want to challenge me? Let's go. I got, uh, I'm afraid of you. And I did, I got respect that way. Uh, and then going up into boxing, I still was, like, even though I was, I was in a good foster home, I still managed to get into a lot of fights growing up. I was always fighting, you know. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't laugh about now because, but when, you, when I was young, I still like, you know, if you disrespect me, I'll, I'll get your respect. You know, you know, and obviously carrying that anger or whatever you want to call it from from, from your past, you feel like that still carries on with you now to this point. Do you know or what? I, yeah, so, yeah. It, do you know what? It was mad because I was, even though I was, I went through all that as a kid, I was still a happy kid. Mm. But if someone poked me, I'd unleash. I was one of those. I'd still be a happy kid, but if you poke me, like I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna give, show you everything. I got a lot of rage in here, you know. Uh, and then when I was growing up in boxing, I learned to control that. You know, I started then when it going on to win, you know, national and Welsh titles. I started to be part of Team Wales. I was Team Wales for 10, 15 years. Uh, I won every national title growing up. Uh, then I went to win British title. And then the big one was winning the Youth Commonwealth Games in India. And I beat a top kid at the time called Jazza Dickens, James Dickens, who's, a, you know, who's done, gone on and done really well as a pro. Um... And then after that, I got picked for Team GB. Mm-hmm. So I became a full-time athlete at the age of 17. You know, I mean, like, I come from the valleys. Like, you know, we had horse and cart. <laughs> you know, we had courses going around with boom boxes. <laughs> you know, we didn't come out of that village, you know. Uh, and through Team Wales and Team GB, I got to travel the whole world, you know, and being a full-time athlete. So I'd have a wage at the, at the end, of, end of the month. And I was training three to four times a day every day. And when I got part of Team GB, like I had so low experience compared to the other boys. Like you know, I mean, in Wales because it was a small country, I I just set the bar on the standard. But I didn't have the experience mm-hmm. as the English boys. You know, the English boys had been even on Team England. We'd have an internationals every week. You know, I got on Team GB. I think I was on sixteen fights. Wow. You know, and everybody on there were on 150 plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can and imagine. the coaches don't look at you at 16 fights, they look at you at the same. You know, so, and in that time of being only in 16 fights, then I won every national title, I won a British title, I won a Youth Commonwealth Games. So the next step had to be that. So, 
I embraced it. I understood also that I knew that I'm not going to have the experience of these guys, so I'm just going to, I'm in the lion's den here. <laughs> you know, but I also understood that I'm not going to get the respect for only having 16 fights. They treated me the same. But then for you, your coach that you said became like a father to figure to yeah. you, he wasn't a part of that transition or that process because you had to move to different coaching teams? Yeah, I, was, yeah, I mean, he was my coach back home. Mm -hmm. And when I come home on the weekends, if I wanted to, I'd always visit the, my local gym and see mm -hmm. and give my, all my kids. I used to give all my kids to the kids. Yeah. You know, you inspire the kids. What they want to be where you are. You know, and then, but I was full time in, in the English Institute of Sport in Sheffield. So our coaches were Rob McCracken. So my Olympic boxing team was you know meet myself Andrew Selby, Andy Joshua, Fraser Clark, Luke Campbell, Tom Stalker, Scott Cardell, um, many more Martin Ward. Gamal Yafai, Khaled Yafai, all Olympians, you know, so I just transitioned over to that team from the 2008 Beijing Olympics, from Billy Joe Saunders, Tyson Fury, all, all from those guys. So we was the next four-year team for the 2012 uh, Olympics, which is incredible, you know, and for us, out of all the Olympics I could have been part of or would have been part of, the 2012 was the big one. It's in our hometown, <laughs> you know, so it was in London. So, it was overwhelming for being to, to hit from being here then to being up there with the best fight uh, athletes in, 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 in on the planet. Really, you know, we were competing with the Russians, the Cubans. You know, from Amir Khan winning that silver medal put us on this map. Mm -hmm. So from the 2000 from Athens, brought made the from Amir Khan going to winning the silver in Athens, brought the, Be the Beijing team for having eight qualified Olympics, and then from that team brought on to having twelve qualified uh, Olympians. So again, you know, it was such an amazing process and team to be part of because this is where now the funding has come in because we've won medals. Now we was on, I was on a full-time wage. At the age of 17, I was on 30 to 40 grand a year with a nutritionist sponsored by Lucas Adidas, you know, psychologist, strength and conditioning. We, had, we didn't have to pay for anything. Yeah. And we didn't have time to spend our money because we used for training four times a day. <laughs> He's going to JDs every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the process is that. I love that. And by being in the lion's den, by not having that experience, Luke was, I can't complain. I just had to be as good as them. You know, so, and I did it. You know, sometimes when you chuck a, uh, a kid in the water when they're young, they got to, they just got to fight to swim. And that's exactly what it was. And I didn't sink. I stayed floating, <laughs> you know. Um, and then unfortunately, going forward, uh, on the Olympic year, um, I started, I, had a, I, had a, I haven't lost in years, and I lost a fight to Jay Harris, who I'd beaten like six times. Um, I, I beat him in every Welsh Championships, every year. And it was, this wasn't in the Championships, this was on a, a, a Commonwealth Federation box-off. And I lost the fight because when I was the age of 16, 17, I'd already been at 51 kilos for like three years. Mm -hmm. So when I signed my new weight of Olympic team in Team GB Boxing, my weight was signed at 51, and I was just turned into a young man then. And I went from training twice a day to four times a day. So my body just started changing dramatically. And I said to Rob, I said, Rob, like, you know, I, know, I said, I'm struggling to make this weight. Ah, you're, you're too small for the weight. You need to, you need to stay this weight. And I said, to Rob, I'm like, I, my body fat is just under 4%. I said, I'm saying, I'm going to die. <laughs> I, like, I, was, I was in the red zone. I was having fines left, right, center, because me, it was me and Anthony and Gogo at the time. Me and him were really struggling with our weight because we were just full of muscle, you know, and yeah, I, I lost that fight then, and I said to myself, I'm never going to put myself through that again of, I was, I was sipping ice cubes for three weeks, like, you know, you, you know this, like, you've been there making weight, and it's probably the hardest thing of fighting, isn't it, is making weight. Well, I always say in fighting, there's, there's three sports, there's training, there's fighting, and there's weight cutting, because the, there's some guys who are incredible in the gym, mm. amazing in the gym, and they're, they're, you know, technically fantastic. Comes to fight night and they bottle it. It's a completely different sport, being able to walk to the ring or the cage and compete, like competition is different, and then weight cutting. But they're three completely different sports. So to be a, an elite level, you have to be good at all three of them. Yeah, you have to be able to train at a very high elite level, which sometimes doesn't mean being the best, but showing up every day, having consistency, not getting injured is a big yeah. part of it, especially in MMA. I'm sure the same in boxing. Um, and then going on to being able to compete and being a weight cut. I was a phenomenal weight cut. That was like, out of the three, that was my strength, cutting weight. I used to fight at 
84 kilos and I'd walk around at like 97, 98 and 24 hours I'd cut 13 kilos, you know, like for the, for the fight. And still felt great in the ring. And still felt good enough. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say great. Um, yeah. But that, that, I, I do know that's very different, especially at, at the Olympic level and, and the high sport level for boxing because you guys don't do a big on-the-day no, weight cut. No, but that was the thing with the heavier boys, they had a bigger gap. Yeah. For me, I was fighting a 51 and my allowance to walk around was 52 too. Yeah, so you can't walk, no, you're not even allowed to walk no, around. No, but I, I would. I, I, at the time I'd gone home and they trained to visit family, I'd be blown up back up to 60 kilo. Yeah, yeah. And then I trained every day for four days. So on the weekend, I'm running the roads at 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock in the morning. And then it still come in, only 53, still over, and I'd have a fine. But he dropped, didn't have a clue. What it took to even get the 53, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I'd sit there, it, it, me and one of the boys, uh, he's a good fighter from Wales, Lewis Reese from the Ronda, phenomenal fighter. And we'd sit and we'd drive to Sheffield with sweatsuit on with a foot with a heaters on full blast for four hours. Yeah. And he'd pass out. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not lying, it was bad. We started our blood test done on the on the end of the finger to test our dehydration skills and I was like ridiculous we done. Brought in a room, grab a ball again, <laughs> slap on the wrist, another fine. But you know, I was finding it hard at that time to perform and it didn't matter how talented I was, and I was I was different to every fighter. My talent is different to every fighter, mm -hmm. you know. Um, if my legs were in there, my hands wouldn't be there. If I was tired, I'd probably be worse than a normal boxer, because if that's not there, my talent does not work at all. Mm -hmm. So I got released from Sheffield. Um, I broke my hand. Um, I couldn't make my weight, and I was devastated. I was because I knew what it took to get there. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was. So, what was the weight class above? It was 51, 56. 56. Because yeah, the girls, the women come into the Olympics, so Tasha, Samana Marshall, mm. uh, all those girls, Nicola Adams, they come in, so they have to take some of the weights. So then we have to split the weights differently. Uh, so it was a bigger gap. Mm -hmm. But I knew, like, you know, I was blown up over 60 kilo. So I moved up a weight on that Olympic year. And I said, and Rob McCracken said to me, oh, you can come back on, but when you win a World Championships at that weight, I goes, I'll come back, but I win up at next weight. Mm -hmm. So I went away for a couple months, I had a little holiday, I come back and I started eating food, like, <laughs> you know, I started drinking water. Yeah. And I, at the, before that point, I generally didn't believe I could get any better because when you were at that pinnacle, it's the highest you could be. Mm -hmm. If anything, I thought I was going to get worse because <laughs> I haven't got that set up anymore. I was back with Team Wills, I said it was good there, but it's not Team GB, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Mate, I started eating my food and I just became a different animal. Mm. It was mad. I started knocking people out. I went faster, I went stronger. I just couldn't believe it myself. My engine was phenomenal because I, like, I was I was dedicated athlete. Like, you know, mm. that was the only number one thing that was killing me was my nutrition. Mm. And even my nutritionist said to Rob, like, I said, he said, Rob, he's, 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 his body fat is in an unhealthy place to be. Mm. You know, I was like, and when I was young, I was an I was an animal. I like I, if you if it was the run test, bleed test, press up, I win. I was really. I knew when my body rested. I don't give a fuck about sparring. When I'm rested, you're having it. But I need to prove to you when I'm deep in camp that I'm aching because I done more press ups and dips and, and I beat you on the bleed test. It's not about now. It's when it comes to the competition. That's when it counts. Mm -hmm. Can you fight five, five five days in a row? I know I will be. Do you know what I mean? Um, so when it come to me moving up a weight, I knew then the guys used to be, sometimes I used to, I used to spar with anyone. You know, for me, when I come back to Wales, I used to struggle getting sparring. So I had a little motorbike and I used to travel anywhere. I used to turn up to boxing gyms on my own and there'd be 20 boys waiting outside the ring for you. Like, <laughs> no, it is because my, my boxing coach was saying at the time, you know, he's, I love my coach, John. Um, I can't get sparring. I haven't got two Dan Chapmans. I said, okay. I said, I'm getting on sparring. I was stubborn, <laughs> really stubborn. So I turned up to every gym in Wales and North Wales, and I travelled the whole of Wales on my motorbike, sparring. I want you to notice, like, look, you go into somebody else's gym, they're not going to be nice to you. They're there to kill you. They, they try to say, this is my home. Yeah, this is my home, and that's the perfect opportunity, because when sparring, if you have sparring partners and people you train with regularly, you don't want to hurt them, because they're your f family, you know, yeah, to an exactly. extent. You know, so, so when yeah. someone comes from the outside, it's, it's like fresh meat. It was, and I and I was so stubborn. I'd be in the corner on my own, no water, and the coach would say, don't water. No. It's that, it's that I'm here, and I'm going to show you I'm the best. And that's what generally made me, it just elevated my career even more on my ability. 
because I'm that independent and thinking for yourself. I've had all this three, four years of Team GB. I know exactly what I need to do. Mm. Now I need to put into play and practice as much as I could. And it, I was hard to coach because I knew so much. It was, it's not that I was uh, I Mr. Know It All, but you show me a way and I'll show you how to do it better. So why am I going to do it your way when I can do it my way better? Mm, mm. And when you come to that experience, you are hard to teach. You just need a, a, a good coach. doesn't have to be teaching you things. Does he provide sparring? Does he turn up to the gym? Does he take you on the pads? Covering the basic needs. So when it comes to the fighting world, a lot of fighters are yes men. They just rely on their coach. I was never one of those guys. Mm. I, I, I could see things and I could observe things and I was obsessed so much that I could do things that nobody else could do because my eyes see things different to your eyes. You just see black and white. I'm seeing a million gray hairs. I want to dig into it more. Where's it all? I kept digging and digging. Like, you know, and for me, it's like I had an imagination. So when it comes to certain parts of the training, a lot of people needed a coach by and pushing them. I didn't need that. You know, my imagination was phenomenal. You watch me on the bag. My imagination is not like anybody else's. I see things. I picture as if someone's in front of me. And that's how you, I practice what I do in my, when I fight. So if I'm doing something a thousand times in my training, I'm going to bring that to the ring. If I don't do that in the gym, it's not going to happen in the ring. It's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. So when I went up that weight, uh, I came back. I went on to win the national title, the senior title. That's what it counts the most as a senior. Mm -hmm. I, once, I, I turned from 17. Then I, I refused to stay youth anymore. I wanted to turn senior. And I beat JRS in a final. When the last time he beat me, and I hadn't lost, that was the first loss in like 15 years. And I... I beat him like 16 mil in the finals of the ABAs. Um, and then I went on then to have Olympic box off against Sean McGoldrick uh, and beat him. So he would have been in the end out of me and Luke Campbell in the World Championships. He would have gone to the Olympic Games. And then I had my motorcycle accident. <laughs> and then, I don't know what, I just couldn't believe it. Like, I mean, I didn't take drugs, I didn't party. What, what my, what I, I came from nothing. The sacrifice, the childhood even that I had I didn't even have a childhood to sacrifice it for a sport then got to the point where in my career where the world was in front of me where so many doors would have opened and at that point I'm not just kidding you when I because I was at that new weight I knew nobody in the world could have beat me I was on a roll do you know when you have you ever had that feeling what do you think I have I feel untouchable right now yeah upward spiral yeah you were an upward spiral it was it was just like the hard work was like was there the, the foundation was there it's like anywhere everyone I was sparring I was hurting like it's like it's like when you look at some of the clips of Mike Tyson growing up through his career and you look at him banging knocking out his sparring partners he was just invincible and I felt like that mm -hmm. I did you know and so when that I came home one weekend and I just got I had a, a letter saying I was back part of Team GB as well and then I was going to Baku for the World Championships for the Olympic qualifier. So the one, who, the only one who was in my weight at that time who was, was going to stop that happening was Luke Campbell. And full fair play to Luke Campbell. Like, you know, the time I was, I was on the team with him for four years and he's not a de more dedicated athlete that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. He was a phenomenal athlete. We trained three, four times a day and he'd shadow because uh, there was a, a thing on the wall, a shadow boxing man, and it says, do you want to be in 2012? And he'd shadow, every session he'd shadow he turned up half hour before and he chatted box in front of that every day. So at the little extras, the one percent, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I knew I'd, I'd done hundreds of rounds of Luke and I knew I'd done good rounds of him, you know, it was very even. And, I, and that one was, it was below. So when I was up in this new weight, I felt very good at the time. I knew that I'd beaten guys who just like Sean McGoldrick in the, in the Olympic box off that I had. He just won a, a senior Commonwealth gold medal in India. In Delhi, I, I, I played with him. Yeah. He was easy work. And he was the number one golden boy at the time. But always also gone on. He's a great fighter, Sean, you know. Um, but when I came home one weekend, I had, my, I had a gym back home. I went to check. And then I was like in, the, in between on, do I go for food? I put petrol in my bike. And I, I went driving like an idiot. I was driving really slow. And I said, oh, I'm going to put petrol in my bike. And then I'm going to come back and open the gym. So as I was going down the hill, car came really fast behind me and I turned my head and on a bigger bike you can't just turn you've got a bank and as I turned back round I just hit the steel girder and uh, I snapped my femur 
in like four or five places. It was really bad. I was on the bank in and I just, I knew, I couldn't feel it at the time. It was a funny feeling. I could feel warmth. And I could feel that my thigh muscle had come up to my stomach. Okay. And at the time, I was thinking, what's happened? And I tried to move and I could hear the grind, bones grinding. And I was like, oh, shit. Then I thought, I can push to my side. I can push up the bank in, isn't it? And as I flopped over to my side, the thigh muscle just flopped. Yeah. <laughs> Came over. I was just in so much pain. And it was, what a coincidence that the car, be, the car that stopped first was a doctor. Straight away got the ambulance in. Um, it was like a nine, ten hour operation. And then after, you know, it, it was, it was, I was in a bad way. I broke loads of other bones in my body. I snapped my femur. The bone was sticking out of, of my leg as well, two ways. And the thought process then of what the fuck had just happened from being Superman <laughs> in your head to being a cripple in hospital. And it was just understanding, like, how am I going to process this? Like, is this real? Is this what happened? I kept thinking it was a dream. Like, you know, I was just thinking, this can't happen to me. Like, why me? I kept saying for, for weeks, why me? And then the news come out that I had a proper chat with the doctor and the doctor said I'd never even train again. What, I'd not even walk tidy again. I'd walk with a limp. I accepted that. Because mm. it comes from a doctor. He knows his shit. You know, he's, he's a professional at what he does. And I was like, like, what do I do? So, uh, how old are you at this point? 20, 19, 20. Yeah. 20. Yeah. Yeah, 20, 21, 20 or 21 years of age, mm. you know, at the moment, where I thought, can life throw any more challenges at me? <laughs> like, you know, from being dust, going through drugs and alcohol, going through foster homes, hostels, not going through different people who don't even know any, like living with people who don't even love you or like you, to dealing with the trauma, the dealing with bullying, going through school because I didn't have nothing. Then finally then going to a good home, changed my whole life. Then the, 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 the ladder, we was going up. There was light at the end of that tunnel. Of course, there were still obstacles in my life as a young man. And then all of a sudden, got to the peak of my career, and then all of a sudden just ripped away. And you just think, like, why, did, why, why has this happened to me? Where I'd given so much of my life to boxing, you know, and I loved every minute of it. To be fair, growing up through that, you know, because of my childhood, when I was traveling, traveling with Team Wales and Team GB, I didn't want to come home to, to Wales. I loved traveling to the third world countries and to these beautiful countries. And all my mates were homesick. They were missing their girlfriends, their dogs, or their parents. I was like, no, I could stay here for another month. I loved it. And that was my, that was my motivation, believe it or not, was I love traveling. I just love seeing parts of the world. Uh, and... So I loved. I actually loved being thrown in lines. Then, you know, I, when I used to have tournaments, I, I wanted to draw the Cuban out first round. I wanted to draw the the Russian or the or the Kazakhstan. At the time, they were the best fighters on the planet. I wanted to see where where I wanted to test where am I right now. And to be experience all those amazing uh, experiences, and then like you said, for my career just to just be gone. And again, I didn't have no backup plan. Mm -hmm. You know. I, I, we did do our personal training courses on Team GB, but we never thought we were going to do that. We just fucked about half the time and threw crayons at each other. <laughs> uh, so then at 21, when that, that all got taken away from you, how long, what, what was next? How did you to, to, handle to, that? I started window cleaning. Right. Uh, I got into a relationship. I got married. But your, your boxing career was done. Oh, it's gone. The doctor said I'd never walk again properly. Okay. I was like, I was back and forth wheelchair and crutches for a year and a half, two years, using my crutches still three years later. And then the, the fear of doing an exercise. So I got into a bit of weights, started doing upper half. I couldn't do nothing with my bottom half. Mm -hmm. bottom half. Um, I, I, I met a girl, got married, and I just accepted I just had to be normal. And that's a, a Welsh girl? Yeah, a Welsh girl, mm -hmm. yeah. And I had a fantastic marriage. You know, um, she was a religious woman. 
You know, um, I respected her rights and respected what she did. And how did you two meet? We were uh, childhood friends. Oh, okay. We was in the same school together. Then when I came back home, we just we just linked up. It was, it was very strange. Um, but I still, even when I came home, I knew I was still alienated to my community. Mm-hmm. I knew I was different. I, I knew I couldn't go back and live how, how working nine to five and then just partying or hiding or trying to get away from the life that they have Monday to Friday. You know, I, I just, I thought if I can't box again, in the meantime of processing that, I was just trying to think, what am I going to do with my life right now? So for me, it was, I started window cleaning because I was working with my partners at the time, uh, her father. It's the, the only thing I could do. Mm-hmm. And it was a good thing because I was climbing the ladder every day, building strength in my legs. And I still had a limp. It was, really, it was crazy. Because uh, I had all metal rods in my leg put in and bolts on my knee. And in that meantime also, I had another obstacle. I had, I had to have a full knee construction on the opposite leg there. So that was hard to take. I was another two years. So... I was just thinking, like, I, ne- I generally didn't think that I could be able to run again. Like, just, just like, go for a jog. Uh, and then I thought, you know what, like, I come from a foster family. I've come from children who've had nothing. It's, I thought I wanted to be working in primary school, working with children with behavior and disabilities. So I applied for the job and I got the job. And I filled the gap for the time being. I was so happy, you know. I thought, I love this. And I was working in a school in Wales called Tondi Primary. Um, and I also worked in a re- child residential home, working with children who were on the last leg on going to a secure unit. So I learned so much on behaviours, traumas, ADHD, Asperger's, Down syndrome. We worked on all those aspects on children who've had terrible lives and have these disabilities. So I understand that it's not just black and white, <laughs> you know, that you can understand. It, it, it actually showed me great patience. So when children are showing all these different behaviours, there's a reason behind these behaviours, you know. Uh, usually it's a scream for help. Um, so having that trust built in up to a point where they, when they do drop their guard, you can get them to do whatever you like. You actually get them to live a, no- a, a normal life, mm-hmm. as they call it, you know. And I loved that, you know. Um, and I was getting trained on numerous courses. And then in between that, I started... A gym close to me said, Don't Dan, you know, um, I used to take a few lads on the pads sometimes, you know, and I was really good on the pads because I'd done pad work my whole life. You know, even when I was a kid, I passed my boxing coaching license at a young age so I could help my coach in the corner, <laughs> yeah. you know, with, with the other kids at the gym. Yeah. That's, that's what we did. It was just a small community. We had nothing. So, and he said, Don't do some personal training. So, on the side of doing that, I used to do some personal training and boxing. Uh, and then in the meantime, I was thinking, You know what? I think. Why don't I just open my own gym? And I thought, I have a good, great. I still have a great name in the community. Um, and in the meantime of that, before I even opened the gym, I went up to watch a bare knuckle fight. My niece said, oh, "Come watch this. It was, it was savage. Like he was in like the white collar world and uh, off license in boxing, and he, he had some contacts up in there. And yeah, I said, oh, okay, that's not something that I would normally watch. I have no interest in. It. I have no clue about it." So I went up to London or two and watched it, and uh, I thought... Was it was in London? Yeah. Oh, because it was big, it was, it was big it, at the O2 then. Yeah, but it was, it was only then just got to London. They were fighting in Hale Bales <laughs> yeah, in yeah, Manchester yeah. and Coventry. And so when I got there... What I was just, the name of this show, you know? It was called Be Bad. Be Bad Promotions. It was a Be Bad. Bad. Be Bad Promotions. Okay. And it's, it was still run by the same company that I'm part of now. Oh, okay. But it was just... It was the beginning. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I went up there and they sat, it, obviously bare knuckle sport at the time which I had no clue on was actually a growing sport. Um, and they were portraying as they were the only legalised bare knuckle company on the planet, which they were at the time. Mm-hmm. I don't know how they got the licence, <laughs> but they, they did. It was all on paper. But anyway, I was watching the f- first few fights and it was this big American. and he must have been about 24 stone. He was huge. And he hit this guy and his eyebrow come off the off his face and it was on the Canvas. It, I mean, and you could see the blood just squirt all over everybody, and his teeth on the on the canvas. I was like, I said, I said to my mate, I said, "Fuck, this is savage." I suppose like, who would want to do this? <laughs> who would want to do this? You gotta be crazy. So that's they got on it. I come home, back to my usual job, in the middle, in the process of opening, open up my own gym because I wanted to be an amateur, full time amateur course. 
a coach because um, I had my boxing licenses. So I thought that was a great way to get the kids off the streets, et cetera, et cetera. Then my best mate, well, he weren't my best mate, one of my close mates, he said, oh, Dan, guess what? I've, like, I've seen you on the bags because I started then, started doing a bit of my bag work because I opened my, I, I was building a place and I had some bags there and I just, I still had a bit of a limp. But after doing a lot of weights, I thought, oh, I'm going to start working my cardio a bit because I feel like I will. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, <gasps> I was breathing really heavy. and I Because I've trained for so many years. When I was doing weights, I put some good size on. You know, because I, I, I was doing cardio years ago. I couldn't put the weight on because I was doing so much boxing and running. Mm-hmm. So I was doing zero running, but I was still lean and shape. So when I started doing weights, I put some weight on. I, I looked good. And yeah, I started doing a bag work. And I, you know, I was like, oh, this feels good, but I was dying. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was fast. Like, I still got my speed. You know, I couldn't push off my back leg properly. I was still fast. Like, and I chucked a couple of videos on. I said, I still got it in the tank. And people started liking it and saying, Dan, you know, are you really still good? You should get back into it. I said, I, I, I generally thought, there's no chance. I still got a fucking limp after three years. You know? And what happened was, um, I was down at Lee Selby's gym. And Lee Selby, he did a sparring partner. He was the IBF world champion at the time. And uh, he asked, oh, Dan, do you want to jump in and do some rooms? I was like, oh, fuck. I can't say no. <laughs> I go, yeah, I'd jump in. And he was fit at the time. And Lee has always been super fit. Like, that was one of his main, uh, I think, top abilities was being punches and bunches. And I sparred with him and I gave him some tough rounds. Like, and I hadn't done a day's cardio. <laughs> right? And he had a big fight coming up. And they said, Dan, like, you know, we'd love to use you for more camps with, with Lee. And me and Lee were good friends anyway. Because uh, me and Andrew, is Andrew Selby, we've been on, we've on team, team Wales and Team GB together. And, and Lee's got something about him, like, you're spiteful. So if you've got his respect, like, he's, like you've earned that. Yeah. And we did, we earned that from the sparring. So my mate then, a couple of weeks later, he said, Dan, you know, I, I, I heard a couple of rumours, like, you know, he did some good rounds with Lee at the gym. He goes, yeah, it's just some sparring. Like, you know, I said, I, I haven't done anything. He said, it's too late. I'm matched up. <laughs> I goes, what do you mean I'm matched up? I put you on a show, on the, on the Ben Knuckles show. I goes, oh. But I couldn't say no. <laughs> I said, but we, if we're doing this, we can't tell anyone. Nobody knows of this. I'm just going to go up there, have a crack, but we don't tell nobody. It's just me and you going to go up. So I don't want anyone to find out because if my wife finds out, she's going to kill me. <laughs> 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 Honest to God, she, had, she was anti fighting. Yeah, she was yeah. religious. Yeah. So she was like, if you go back boxing, you're gone. <laughs> Off with your head, right? <laughs> so, and the thing was, leading up to this was brilliant because I just opened my gym then. And it, I was only like, I was part time at the gym, so I was working and then opening in the evenings. So, I also I started coming home with black guys. Oh, I said, oh, bit of the medicine ball hit me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> every excuse, every excuse. And um, anyway, I got, I got, I had the fight, and I knocked the guy out in 30 seconds with a jab. And I went in there, and I thought, what? like, I heard his nose snap. There's a video, it's on my social media, I'll show you it, where I just go, touch, touch, and he throws a shot, and I go, still, boom. And I could, I was like, I could hear it, like, completely snap. And down he goes, he went down like a sack of shit. I was like, fuck, I like that. <laughs> that was mad. <laughs> and I, I, after the punch, I shook my hand because I was like, oh, because it's bare knuckle. Like, you know, it was nothing on my knuckles. Yeah. Like, I never, like, my like my hands were always, I was always told to look after my hands. Mm. You know, so hitting someone clean. And then you and the, the effect after, and everyone went in the crowd went, oh, because they could hear the snap. Yeah. And... That day onwards, I just had the bug for it. And then, so then at this point, how many no. how many fights had you had boxing? No. Oh, I don't know. In amateurs, I'd have about 100 amateur fights. So you had, by this point, you, you were. Yeah. So the guy that you were fighting against knew that you had competed at, with yeah, Team I've been out of the sport of for course, eight years. Of course, that's what I'm so saying. So that's the thing was, everyone was thinking, the guy took the fight because I'd been, I'd, I'd been disappeared for nearly nine years. But then still, you still were known within the sport. Like, the people still a knew little you or a little bit. Because, you know, from when I'm thinking about the times, this is before Instagram, before yeah, when you was. were boxing. Was well, before Instagram was race. just new then. Yeah. So, when I come on the scene then, and because I didn't tell anybody, mm. and after that knockout, the video went viral. Yeah, it went everywhere, yeah. No, I mean, like, what viral. Mm-hmm. I had promoters calling me. 
a pro promoter's calling me to sign up to turn pro. I was just like, whoa, this is mad. You know, like, I just, I just want to get out of the jam. You know, it, uh, and after that, I had a break because obviously the missus didn't agree what I was doing. I came home that day. <laughs> like it was ructions in the house. And this is where I realised, well, of everything I was doing, it's nothing filled the gap like boxing and mm. fighting. And I was pretending to be something that I wasn't. And I was living two different lives. You know, it, it, which I was lying all the time <laughs> to my partner because I, I didn't want the consequences of the arguments when I was going home. And it pushed me away from her because I knew that she didn't agree what I was doing. And I, because I, I respected that, I was stuck in 20, uh, class 22 because I've never had family and now I've got a family. And if I went back boxing, I would lose that family. And she was deadly serious about that. She was like, you know, or, or if you go back on, I'm just going to give you a slap on the wrist. Or she was like, go back boxing. I was like, this is not going to work. Mm. So I was like, catch 22 all the time. So I'd stop. Then I'd go back training. I'd stop. So I was another two years of not doing anything. And then BKB went big. Um, and then they started doing 10 grand prize tournaments, the prize fighter tournaments. And at the time, I was weighing like 61 kilo. And the new tournament was from 76 to 81. <laughs> and I said to Jim, the guy who only said, I went in. I can beat these guys. I watched the guys who were going in, and I said, I can beat every one of these guys, even at my weight. He said, but you're not that weight. I said, I'd be that weight on that day. <laughs> 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 so they put me in the tournament, and I, <laughs> I had like a bucket army for this fight. I was thinking I was so fucking fat, <laughs> but just to put the weight on, but then when I, when I was jumping on skis, I had to weigh with ankle weights on my waist. So I put 14 kilos of ankle weights, seven and seven tied around, and keys on phones in my pocket. <laughs> Honestly, God, is brilliant, mate. Honestly, if, if you would just, would have been there, you'd have been pissed yourself. I had four meals that day as well. <laughs> eat, I had all you could eat Brazilian, the uh, Viva Brazil thing in the London. I, was like, I, mean, I said to my coach, I said, bro, I can't breathe. <laughs> You've got to make this weight. I said, I, uh, I, I didn't make the weight the first time. So on the second time, they put keys on phones in my pocket. Made the weight. Drew, drew, uh, Make drew. the weight by, by, by putting on weight. So you went from when you were doing the, the Olympic boxing or yeah, the from Team the GP, you were 51 struggling to go down, and now you're trying to get to 76. So it's impossible. <laughs> I'm not, I'm the heaviest I can go is 67 kilo. Yeah. You know, that's the heaviest I can go. Yeah. Uh, so jumped to the scales, and I drew up. The best one at the time was James Canelli. So he'd had over 80 amateur boxing fights. Being a tough guy, being in jail, all that bullshit. And this was the one. Like I said, this is, here we go. And he was six foot two. He was huge. I, like, I didn't realize how big he was until we like met on the conference day. So I touched gloves. I was like, oh, fuck. He's so big. <laughs> and it was mad because I guess just the confidence I knew with my experience how big you are, I got you, like, you know, and the fight was a great fight, he gave me, you know, from his reach, he hit me with a jab the first round, I couldn't see a fucking thing, he hit me so square in the pupil, that I had to close my eyes to see one of him, because there's ten of him otherwise, mm. and I didn't show him that he caught me, he was, I was bleeding, but he went, I didn't care about the cut, he hit me so square in the pupil, that, it, like, I couldn't see, so the plan that I had going into the fight, it's fucking, it's gone, <laughs> So I took it to him. Uh, I dropped him twice. I just, I just used then my experience. Mm. So I just stepped in. Step, I knew I was going to land with that right down. I, I remember it into the stomach. I remember bending him in half because I was, I was heavy. I was whacking. And uh, dropped him twice and then got the win. So, you know, that was a big statement because nobody thought I could beat these guys at that weight. They were so big. And the ring in the bare knuckle is so small. It's like a phone box. I could touch corners with him from my opposite corner. Do you think that helped you? Because you're, or does or hinders you? No, it's just that I'm a mover. Because your style's a mover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, I have nowhere to run. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's, a, it's, it's a fight, you know? So he brought the dog in me. And it's a great fight, to be fair. And he, and he, he was, you know, for me, like, you know, I should never been at that weight. But I, that's what I had to do to make a name for myself in the bare knuckle world. You know, I knew no one was going to fight me after that first fight at my weight. It'd be murder to get someone to match me. And especially then I actually started training properly. Mm. I started putting videos on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and then my, my videos started traveling and people were more interested. I was sparring with top world champions, European champions, and beating them up in their own gyms. But at the time I was in 
all in on a bare knuckle. And people were asking me at the time, Dan, why didn't you turn pro? I was still going through this situation with my partner of like, well, I, she didn't want me to fight. And it was just such a, a sad time in my life that I should have turned pro when I knew I should have turned pro. Mm. Instead of fighting. In secret, basically. In secret. Or not realising that this may, this relationship maybe is not going to work. And it's sad because she was a good wife. Mm. You know, she was an amazing partner. But the person you love the most needs to be there with you when in these battles. It's not about, you know, fighting isn't just about fighting. It's the emotional ride to it and after it. So the person I loved the most wasn't there in my fights. And that broke me. That's what made me made the decision. It was like, for me, as if that person was good at something, I'll try the whole world to support that. This doesn't mean she's a bad person. Just for me, it made me feel that I'm not in the right place to be in a relationship because I, my focus is I want to be back, battle, back on boxing. That's what made me a man again. You know, I, I, until then, I was living, I was lost. Mm. You know, I just, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just going with the flow. I was trying things to fill the gap. And for me, as I won't be an authentic, I, I'd lost myself. You know, and for the experience, life experience that I had as a young child, to go through all that, I didn't want to be that person lost. I, wanted to, I didn't want to be like sheep. Like, I wanted to be authentic. And when I was fighting, I was. You know, I was Dan Chapman. You know, but still a nice guy. Because of... I could speak about my past in severe detail because I had dealt with my past. So I love being that role model for these people who didn't have that role model who'd been in those lifestyles, or that, those terrible childhood um, situations. I'm, I wanted to be that person who says, if you're going through that, look, you can still be this. Do, do you understand? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I love working with children in schools and with, with behavior because I, I, I understand. I've been through all that. I, I, the, the, the thing that got me through it, unfortunately, was I didn't carry ADHD. I didn't carry autism from the defects from my parents. I'm not saying you have to have a defect from your parents to have that, but nine times out of ten, if you've been brought up through drugs and alcohol, like I was born with heroin in my system, so there should have been some sort of defect for that. But when I was growing up, I realized I didn't have those defects, so I was, but I was like, I'm blessed. I don't need the most of this opportunity of that. My brain works okay, <laughs> you know? Do you think... You, you know, obviously, uh, drugs, alcohol, being addicted to these substances, you feel like maybe you're replacing substance with boxing. It could have been. That so could have been my addiction, but I 100% believe, even if it weren't boxing, I was like I said to you when I was young, I was still a happy kid. Mm. I still was positive. I was never, the, you can play a survivor, you can play a victim, or you can play a survivor. I was always a survivor. Whatever happened in my past, I never spoke about it as a kid. But then, you think, how do you think you became? Wh why do you think you chose to be a survivor instead of a victim? Like because I, at that point, when I was young, I allowed someone to love me, so I could let all my trauma go. I when I was young, a lot of people still carry their trauma from years ago because I still haven't dealt with it. Mm. I dealt with all my shit at the age of 12, 13. and I let it go. I didn't put it in a small box in you. I didn't, you know. Uh, for every, anything that I did wrong in life, I didn't blame what happened in my past. I'd be ashamed if I done that. Mm. I, don't, I can't actually say what made me uh, not do that because I know a lot of people do that when they've been through that. But I never played victim. If anything, I, I wanted to never talk about that I was in foster care or been through drugs and alcohol. When I was growing up, I was embarrassed. I just wanted to, at the time, fit in. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized I tried to fit in in my community, I realized, oh, I'm, I'm still a bit of a black sheep. Why am I a bit of a black sheep? Why am I not fitting in with the cool gang or this gang or this group or that group? Because I was, do you know why? Because I could make my own fucking decisions from a young age. I had to make my own decisions from a young age. So I carried that growing up. So when people ask me, do you want to drink? I said, no. When people offer me drugs, I said, fucking no. No, other people go, mm, I don't know. Do I try it? And when people go, mm, I don't know, the other people who the peer pressure of taking drugs and alcohol are like, oh, go on, go on. It's okay, I'm doing it. You know? And then all of a sudden, once they do it once, and then they follow them again, happens again. And then when they're growing up, it, but this is still what they do. But I was like, no. And that wasn't because of my past. I just didn't want to. 
especially because I love sport. I was actually a really, had lots of energy growing up. I love football. Football was my first sport. Got into boxing. I was like, well, no, that's going to ruin my health. I'm not doing that because it's going to affect my boxing. So I think the, the, the answer to that, Luke, was I was so independent in making the decision. I, didn't, I never had anybody influence my decision. I was strong enough mentally to say no or yes to something that I wanted to do. And if there was something wrong, and I deal with that consequences, and if, I, if there was a mistake, I wouldn't make that mistake again. Mm. And that was the difference. We all make mistakes. I wasn't a perfect child by far, but uh, if it happens over once or twice, is it really a mistake? Mm. What I find with this is, uh, from speaking to lots of different people, successful people as well, is what you're describing to me is that you're very self-analytical. So mm. from a young age, you decided like, okay, if I did this, okay, you might say maybe you made a mistake or whatever you did. Yeah you then would look back on it and think, I don't want to do that because I want to go down this road and you could almost see the future. You know, so you were self-analyzing yourself and by self-analyzing yourself, making better decisions moving forward. Do you know what? It, it w I didn't even overthink that. I wouldn't even, mm. my, I didn't even uh, overstep that is the fact that I didn't want to be like that again. So it w I didn't have to think about if that, that that's going to affect this and that. By having that bad feeling, I already knew from the first step and the other thing is that you got, I saw as a bit of a curse in the beginning was I'm like that sixth sense because I had from a young age dealt with dealing with people's different uh, emotions and feelings dealing through drugs and alcohol the circumstances of body behaviours and actions I've always been super observant of that and I do it now so naturally that you wouldn't people wouldn't even know that I'm doing it I don't even realise I'm doing it I can be in someone's company usually and go straight away I'm like mm, nice guy I say hi and that's it I can mm. look at that. You can read the people well because you Very can see. Very well. Yeah. And, I, and I, don't, I, I never say, don't judge a book by his cover. I'm not that kind of guy. Sometimes you, I might bump into that person again. And if it changes, that's okay. But I'm smart enough to know if that person's going to, you know, start having any interaction with my life. Like I've always said that I have full control of my behavior, but I don't have control of others. So anybody shows me that behavior, I don't take it personal. I say, you problems, not me problems. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So... When I'm in this position, I and I also understand there's a reason for their behavior. So I'm not going to go into detail with that. If they're going to tell me that, or if they humble themselves in a way to uh, drop the ego or drop whatever pressure they have around them to speak to me about that naturally, then I might understand that. But if, I'm, if they're not willing for me to understand that, that's not my issue. They've got to work that out for themselves. You and I know people who have gone through some severe things have hit rock bottom for, for them to actually change their life. For people to stop smoking, sometimes they can have a, 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 a doctor's alert to change that. But I'm not that person to do that. For me, prevention before injury. Mm -hmm. It's always the case. They're like, I'm not going to do that if it's going to do this to me. Other people don't. They, they need a scare to them to stop. And that's the same ru like, uh, rule I sort of play in every part of my life. You know, I don't try and a ignore things are gonna self uh, things are gonna sabotage me like I want to be around positive people like you know the saying if you bother with dumb people who come down if you bother with wise people who come wise if you come if you bother with five millionaires you're gonna be the six mm -hmm. and, and that's another great motto but even when you're around those people you still have independent choices I sort of think like this all stems not that I know but I'd say it stems for you like you said when you drop your mother in your life at that moment mm -hmm. in time I think you 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 then saw the the positives of, let's say, I don't want to yeah. use the word toxic, but it negative like, people yeah, it was, it was, being, yeah. be, being dropped out of your life. So for you now, you're super, super understanding in that I don't want to be associated with people that have a negative effect on my life. So you were like, okay, I'm only going to we'll move towards positive people. The positive people I'll let into my life to improve my life positively. But if you, even, even if I have a sense, even if my sense is wrong, yeah. that you could be negative towards me or you could affect my life negatively, no, not interested. And you move on to the next next. I, I've done a bit of research. I was speaking to this chap, um, and he said, Dan, you've got a bit of stoicism in you. Mm. And I said, what's stoicism? He said, have a little look. And I have a look. There's like an old emperor back in the day, and how he thought. And right now, like you said, like you said about, a lot of people need to be around positive people to be positive. Mm -hmm. I'm still not that guy. Of course, that's great. Everybody wants to be in a position where they're around positive people, of course. And you still have that one still playing victim, still. So, again, that's a bit of self-work you need to do. But I'm okay on my own as well. I'm not hiding on the rock. I'm not pushing people away. But if I'm on my own, I can have food on my own. I can go for a walk on my own. 
you know, I can go for a coffee on my own. I can do things by myself. And that's understanding that you have, that you're happy in your own company. So whatever company is, comes part of that, that's okay. So I don't even have to be around positive people to be positive because I'm quite positive myself. And, and a lot of people say, oh, you, don't wait, you can't wake up motivated every day. Mate, I fucking do. I do. I, I, I ask to God. A lot of people say, yeah, we all have bad days. But you look at today. And we, we, mental health is such a big subject. Like, but, and we've got the, the, part, the 90s and past suffering through mental health and the past traumas. And we've got the newer generation then that's suffering through anxieties with mental health mm-hmm. because they're so worried of what's going to happen in the future. Mm-hmm. But both generations are still not focused on right now. Right now, if you focus on right now, that means you can have a little bit of a control in the future. If you focus on right now, then that means you're leaving your mind go on some of the traumas that happened in your previous life, but still able to deal with it, but still having still some positive impact on right now. Because right now, we can change that. There's no point me reflecting in the... Like, if I look back on the shit that I went through as a child, I'd be in a secure unit. <laughs> Mate, it's bad. Yeah. You know, and like you said about the situation I let my mum go on, a lot of people go, how come you don't talk to your mum? Like, but do you know what things she put me through as a young child? But I don't have to explain that. But they don't understand. They can't, they can sympathise, they can't emphasise. It's two different words, isn't mm-hmm. it? So, they they don't understand it because they've never been, they've not understood because they're a mum or a dad, I've given them love basic needs, done everything that they need. And I understand that. that they can't understand that. I don't expect them to understand that. But when it comes to cutting my mum off, it was me realising, like, what good is she going to bring me? This, this way, you know, it's like a friendship. When you look at back, when I look back at some of my friends in school, I, realize, Fuck, I had some shit friends in school. <laughs> no, you do. Didn't you? Course, you look back and think, you think they were, the, they were your best mates in school. And you look back and think, Fuck, they were so bad. Is it 50, at least min, basic standard, 50 50 energy? If they are not giving you that, it's got to go. And that's the way I work, you know. And I'm one of those guys. I mean, if you're not giving me that, the same as I'm giving you, you're a shit friend. Fuck off. I think that's what I'm saying. So you've developed that through that, or, or the way I describe it, or we talk about it as like value exchange. Yeah. So w- within your life, the person you're speaking to, you talk about energy, right? You know, if they're not giving you that energy that you're giving them, there's no value to that association and i don't ha- have any negative effect towards you or to anything like that but i will only deal with people me personally i'm talking about now yeah. that give me that value exchange i haven't got time on this planet mm. to deal with people that are not willing to give me value you know it doesn't mean that i'm using them and i'm trying to suck out value i will give them value back so I, I, yeah but again that's exactly what it goes down to look is our principles are different to them mm-hmm like if you were driving down a school and the and the and the road sign says thirty mile an hour, does that mean you drive thirty mile an hour? No, it's the principle of it, isn't it? You would drive slower. The law says I can drive thirty mile an hour, but again, when we deal with friends, I know what I can bring to the table as a friend. So if you don't, I don't mean that I need the same as much as I would give, but I at least need fifty percent. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, dealing with friends, and it's not just friends, it's family. They are burden family sometimes, you know? Well, that's what I think a lot, this one, I think it's interesting, your story, but I think a lot of people struggle with this, especially when you talk about friends and family, but friends too. Like, as you elevate through life, which you have done, becoming a world champion and moving up and doing everything you're doing, you become in a certain position where the people that are not helping you grow are not feeding you or not improving your life, you have to cut them off. Mate, you absolutely. For me, where I am in my life right now, it's time is for me is the most precious thing on the planet mm. right now. I got, I'm, I'm old enough to understand that. When you're young, you, you, you think you've got all the time in the world. <laughs> you know, I felt like I was 19 yesterday. <laughs> I wish. But now, time, once it's gone, you cannot get it back, man. You cannot get it back. So when I'm, I'm so busy with my work, my fighting, my training. So when I actually have got my own personal time, anybody who's in that time, it's precious to me, like super precious. I don't want to waste that. I want to. I want to be around real people. I want to be around people, uh, even if they got ambitions. I'm like, I'm there to supplement that, not take that away. I'm like, yeah, mate, I'm, that's a wicked idea. Even if it's a shit idea, <laughs> go and do it. Yeah. Do you do understand that? But if he's being a dickhead, I tell him he's being a dickhead. Yeah, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you know what I mean? So again, that's real friends. It's, it's being honest and communicating. Like my best friend here, John. 
sometimes like we could be in the same room with each other for three hours and not say a word. We can, might not even have to drop each other a message in a week. Nothing changes because we know at that time I don't need your energy. You don't need my energy. And when we need each other, we say, oh, Dan, you want to come for a coffee? Yeah, no problem. Be here in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Do you see that type of energy is that being a friend is in all areas, is, is that you, you, you vibe off each other, you don't suck each other's energy. And if you are doing that, you, you communicate. Uh, and then I think, especially men, we talk about masculinity. It's something that over the years we've never done is talk about how we feel, emotions. We just told to be a lion. I get that. We are lions. We built to be providers. I get that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to, you know, realizing that suicide is one of the biggest, men's suicide is one of the biggest rates it's ever been, then we have to talk about masculin masculinity and mental health. There's something not right. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Well, what, what do you think it is that's, that's plaguing masculinity that's hurting people at the moment? For well, you? Of course, for me, it is, is obviously through social media, of course, by trying to be uh, successful. And it's, but again, your success to somebody else is seen as successful. It could be totally different. Again, we know we're all born with different abilities. So the old saying, you, you've got to piss with a cock you got. <laughs> no, it is, isn't it? It's, you know, I'll say that again. You've got to piss with a cock you got. Right, okay. You know, so for me, it's like, accept that. You know, if I, if I was going to be world champion boxer, I accept that. I need to find something I'm fucking good at. Don't waste your time. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you understand? So that's what's happened. Even with me coming back into my career of boxing after my accident, I had a massive sit down with myself before going back boxing. I didn't just go thinking I'm a dreamer going, I'm going to be a world champion bare knuckle fighter. I was like, let's look at where I am in my life right now. Have I still got my speed? Have I still got that mental spirit, that drive? And I knew I was going to do that. I knew that. I had no ifs, no buts. But not if I didn't. I'd be like, I'm, I'm honest with myself. I'm realistic. I'm not going to say I'm going to do something. And I, I nothing more embarrassing than say sometimes. So I'm going to do this, and then it doesn't work out. Really. I just, you know. <laughs> so for me, it's like, I've, I'm, I, see, I, think, I think men, please just be real with yourself. Accept what you are. Accept that. You know, and, and the things that you do want to work on, work on it quietly. Don't be so negative on yourself. Work, look, I've been a coach for a long time, and when I'm working with a client, I, go, I don't go, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong. In fact, they leave the session, they think, fuck, am I doing anything right? Do you understand? So, man, we, we like positive shit. We like positive energy. We thrive off that. We like people saying good things about us. Yeah, I was used to say, uh, as a coach as well, and a person that's worked, is like, I deliver bad news as a shit sandwich. Yeah. So you say, like, this is really, really good. This needs work. This is really, really good. So you're still giving them the, the negative that they have yeah, to work on. So you give them two positives either side of it. So then they, you know. They left the carrot dangling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you so know what you're, mean? You're like, you, this is great. This needs work. If you got this better, it would be perfect. But this is good. So it's yeah. like, okay, I've just got to work on that one thing, but I'm still moving in the right direction. He's like, I think that goes He's like, oh, coach told me I was good at this. <laughs> That's the motivation, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and you obviously we have other mindsets. Some people like to be saying that they shit with this and you shit this, you're not going to make it. And that's something that drove me when I was a kid. When I was going through the well set that they were saying, you're not good enough, not good enough. I was like, I show you I'm good enough. <laughs> I'm good, you know. But again, our self-belief as well mixed with that, you know. And sometimes we can contradict each self what we're saying. But in that moment when someone tells that you can't do something, as a man, I'm going to show you I fucking can. You know, so these are things that life also throws us and sometimes it makes you the, the better person later on and I feel like where I am in my life right now I'm such a hot-headed child that you know I was so I would have to fight the world anyone say anything to me I'll fight you <laughs> you know it was I was such a like, like Mowgli walking around with my bowl haircut I'll fight you <laughs> uh, I'll fight you in a car park anywhere uh, but do you know what I think it's taking the, to be the, I'm so calm in my life right now I'm so chilled I'm so laid back there but it's taken a lot of violence for me to be this calm. <laughs> but you think that helps with, the, with, the, with your choice of life? And obviously with fighting and com competing, you think, obviously being that hot-headed child, being mobile, yeah. as you said, it's like, do you think that's brought you to where you are today? Or you think you I mean, can do it as a calm percent Luke, you know, it's just, it's understanding, like you said, I said, like, it's that, I had that sixth sense growing up. I didn't just have it with others. I had it fully understanding my own emotions, mm. my own feelings. And was I going to grow up and self-sabotage my own? capabilities I realized if I carried on acting that way is my how much of a good boxer I am or a 
portray as I'm a nice guy, I'm going to end up jail or dead. I can't be fighting thugs on the street or mm. when I've had a drink or this or that. You know, I can't be doing that. I don't want to be known for the guy in the local town for knocking someone out after they've had 10 beers. That's not respect. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that. So the thing is, it was just my, I, my one of my biggest role models to myself was, can I be a role model to others? But who's now, for you right now, who would you consider a role model? You don't have a coach. You coach yourself right now, or you have a I've coach? Got a, I've got a coach, Kerry. He's my pad man. He's been, he's, you know, I've just, I've built enough relationships here to just, I think once you come this far in your life, the only person who can be your own motivation is yourself. Mm -hmm. I really believe that because every time I dip into other people's lives, I sometimes I think I don't mean to be, I'm not, I'm not perfect at all, far from fucking perfect. But when I dip into other people's lives, I think, fuck, I have got my shit together. Mm. I really have. I'm in a good position. You know, and, and I understand everybody else is dealing with their shit. I respect that. But for me, is I am always my own motivation. No one's going to wake me up in the morning to get up and do my work. No one's going to get me, push me into do my training. No one's going to, you know, help me for no reason half of the time. You know, because everybody's busy in their own world right now, aren't they? Mm. Uh, and again, when it comes to setting an example, it's like I've worked with many people that, you know, you, have you ever had people who, who try to help people just to change them to be a better person? And it never works. <laughs> so the best thing you can do is set the example. Show yourself that you're doing that. And they look at you and they say, you're doing it again and again. And, they, and you don't have to say anything. So I'm showing my actions all the time. Mm -hmm. Actions, actions, uh, consistency, you know, structure. And... By doing that, that's what sets. That's what changed people's lives. You know, one hundred percent. I think you're a great example of that, especially with the past that you've just got. I didn't know your past. No, I know, I know. So, it's like okay. for me, it's super, super good, um, interesting. But for me, I, I, how I describe it, because I've been in the same place, like boxing, bare knuckle, even more, mm. it gives you what I call like clarity of purpose. So you have, yeah. you, it's easy for you to get up in the morning and work out because you know you got to do it because yeah, it's yeah. your whole life, right? Yeah. So. The thing that I'll find interesting is when that ends, because it's going to end, and you, yeah. you're fully aware that that's yeah. going to end, as, as it has for me, mm -hmm. because that's what I went through. Like when my fighting career ended, or I decided to end it, I had about two, two and a half years of, of, of that lost feeling that you were describing mm -hmm. when you got married yeah. and when you, you were a window cleaner and when you went to. So, again, not, I hope you fight forever and you do your no, thing, and but, but when that, as that, is coming how are you preparing yourself to deal with that loss you know? I, I'm, al I'm already transitioning mm -hmm. so I've already I love coaching that fills the gap nearly is just as good as fighting I'm so still obsessed with boxing that my passion for teaching is just and what I feel blessed about more than anything is I'm a teacher I'm not a I'm not, I'm, I don't just I, someone can tell you what to do and someone can teach there's, there's teaching and there's telling. Mm -hmm. So everyone who works for me, they, a lot of people come to me because they see what I do. But when I'm teaching someone, it's not about me anymore, it's about them. And as a coach, you have to let that go. And I've seen lots of good coaches and got ex-boxers. They haven't. It's still about them. And I'm thinking, oh, guys. You know, like, and the other person is just like, yeah, I do what you because you know what you're doing. You, you was the man back in the day. But it's not my job is to find, to get them to be authentic. Because they're not Dan Chapman, they are them. And as a coach, my job is to go through the fundamentals, express to them how to deal with their social media, how to, to manage, to be calm, to be professional, make sure you've got all your kit. Just do as, as a coach does, provides all these things to make boxing that little bit easier because boxing is fucking savage. So my job is to teach them. I'm not just a coach, I'm a life coach. Mm -hmm. So my job is to do them is then teach them to be independent like I was. So even though you've got me as a coach, I don't need to be a yes man. I need to look at your favorite fighters. And if, if you feel like you can do that in your own time, you practice that. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, that's how I'm going to teach guys to be authentic. And when I see these authentic fighters coming through, I think, oh, I love this. You know, you look at, you look at uh, Eubank back in the day, walking away with his chest up, puffed up <laughs> like a silverback, wouldn't he? But I can't take that away from him. That's him being him. People love that. Ali would run his mouth. Tyson Fury, Mike Tyson, the baddest fighter. They weren't pretending to be anybody, these fighters. They were being them, and that's why they made it, because they were special people. Mm -hmm. 
you're not going to be special if you blend in like fucking everybody else. Right? And for me, is my job is to find that belief in them, give them the confidence. You know, even though we can be good at our sport, like you've seen a lot of good gym fighters, but when I come into that ring, they fell apart. Mm. It's confidence, the big C. It's one of my favorite things. My favorite thing right now in my career is that build up to the fight. You know, when the work has been done, not going into the change rooms, putting the shorts on, being so calm, knowing I am cut the fucking corner. So this is my night. This is about me. Everyone's watching me. And when I, like, this is when I come up to my fight now on the 16th of September. I'm up against a really good opposition. I'm fighting a guy, Ishi Smith, IBF world champion as a pro, trained with Mayweather, was on a control con- a contender in America, super well known. My job is to go in there and rip his asshole up. I'm going to show him the, the levels that I didn't have time off. I went, the only time I had off was when I was injured and I was still training. My job is to go in there now and be Dan Chapman. I'm not going to be going there and be anybody else. I don't care about his name. It's my night. Mm. You know, it's my show. Uh, and for me, is that's when I, I have full control of that switch loop because I know when to turn that switch on. So I turn that switch on when I'm training and I turn that shot switch straight off because I can't carry that persona walking around as that fucking superhero. That's what I do. When I turn that switch, I think I'm a superhero. But you've got to learn as a guy that you've got to switch that off. You've got to save that energy for that. So when I'm outside of that, I'm back to being a normal guy. I'm chilled. Like People look at my life and think, oh, it's busy. But in my personal life, God, I'm boring. <laughs> so boring. <laughs> like an old man. I go home, I chill, I play with my dog. You know, I don't live the part. I don't care about what car or uh, fancy watches. I, I'm, I'm happy with my own space. I'm happy with my own time. Like I said, that time is precious to me. That's my time to recharge. If I don't do that, I just become, I'm, I'm walking around like a, like, like a crazy chicken. <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? Flapping his wings all the time. You can't keep flapping. The ones who flap are empty glass bottles usually, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. I do my talking when I'm punching. So that's my actions. And then after that, I try, I'm trying to keep on calm. And then, you know, you said as a coach, mm. you try and install the big C, you call it confidence, big, confidence. In, in, into people and try and find them and unleash their own personality. 100%. How do you think, you know, you're obviously an extremely confident guy. How do you think you install that into others? What, what are they? What do they need to become as confident as you are when you become that superhero? It gives for me because I went. When it comes to being the best vision of yourself to be a best boxer, you've got to be obsessed. It's as simple as that. You, you can't play boxing or MMA. You can't play Thai box. You can't play any sport. It's if you're not obsessed, you're wasting your time because. Even the ones who were struggling with drugs and alcohol, going growing up superstars, they were still obsessed with their sport. They could do things with a football or a, or a boxing bag or a, or a tennis racket or whatever you want to call it, but nobody else could do it because they mind work different, you know. And when you mind work different, usually these are the ones who are obsessive with their sport, you know. And, and even if, even if you haven't got the talent, if you're dedicated and you've got hard work, that's still a, a obsessive behavior, isn't it? Mm. It's not giving up. So it all interlinks. So if you look over the years where you've had someone who's super dedicated and you've got one who's just only super talented, but now he's got to have them both. So that became a special package when you've got talent and hard work. So my job is, like, whatever happens, it's hard work. Mm-hmm. Fuck the talent. Even if, you, if you're hard work and you put the effort in your structure, you can, you can achieve many things because when it gets to that level, all the flies drop off. I remember being 14, 15, winning Welsh Titans with some really good kids. And I, they were better than me, some of them. Were like, I admit that. I, I was good at my weight. Those guys were way better than me. Mm-hmm. And when I got to senior level, where were they? Mm-hmm. They all fucking quit. Then I went up another six levels. And you got that one down the pub saying, then, oh, I was better than him. I, I was like, no, mate, you quit. And I went up another fucking six levels. You can give it the big one down the pub. But when I got to senior level, that's when it counts. It doesn't matter when you're a child. Oh, when do you play for Swansea City? Or... Or Arsenal, when he was 12. Who gives a fuck when he was 12? <laughs> Do you play as a senior? Mm. We're all men then, because when you're young, we all mature quicker than others. We see things. Uh, some people are bigger than others. But when it comes to senior, no, you're f- everybody's fully uh, developed then. So that then separates the boys from the men, doesn't it? Mm. So for me, is I, only, I get respect when people are at that senior level and still pulling up with bags. So my job is, yeah, hey, stay on track. Or you're going to quit like everybody else. You can be the best now, but can you do it when you're 17, 18, when you turn in only to be a man? That's when it counts. No one remembers when you're a child. 
people don't even remember when you go and see one thing. And then if you take you, t- you take that out of the boxing world, mm. this is what I've managed to do, if you want to call it that. But using that, me- I mean, your mentality is is bulletproof. Utilizing that mentality and then putting that across other facets of life, which you don't have to worry about right now. Yeah. But if you were speaking to a young, like you said, fifteen year old kid who doesn't box, yeah, but isn't confident, is timid, doesn't know how to instill that in himself. What, what kind My of advice is to uh, go and find a club, a sport. You know, so you've got these kids and they don't know what they do and they steal in, they're messing about, they're on their social media, they're selling drugs, whatever. And they want to, they've in the back, everybody has goals, everybody has ambitions, especially when you're a kid because your imagination is, is different when you're young. Mm. You know, you think you can achieve anything when you're young. So they do have goals and, and they do have things that they want to do, but if it gets taken to the side by drugs or alcohol or doing things that they shouldn't do, then me and people like you who have that respect, who we, who are, we are well known, and when we talk about these things, we say, guys, stop the drugs, stop the alcohol, get into a sport, find something that you like to do. And that's the motivation. When they do become part of the sport, that's where the confidence comes. Mm. They start socializing. They start build, They start feeling good about themselves. They start doing, someone's giving them praise. Some of these kids have never had a praise, a, a, a pro, a, approval in their life. They've always been told, oh, you're shit, you're rubbish, you can't do this. Or they haven't given people, they, these people or teachers haven't even given them the time because They've gone, to stu- they've gone to university, they've got their teaching degree, and because they show behavior, or this, or you're naughty, you are, when they don't realize the reason why they're showing this behavior is there's a reason behind that. Do your fucking courses. You know, do therapeutic lessons. Understand why this child is giving you this behavior. Build a relationship with this child for, it, for the child to be honest and trust you, and then you get to see the real child. You know, so the thing is, is again, and I could, that's not what we teach us, just coaches in all sports. You know, you've got to understand that most of the best sports stars have come from a shit background. You know, so, again, you know, my advice to all the people like us, when we do these podcasts, when we go and visit in schools, when we do the interviews after, uh, and we interact with these children or young adults on social media, we are their inspiration. So we can, we can, we can, we can lead an horse to water, but then we can't make them drink it. Mm-hmm. So it's up to them then, isn't it? Because they are dealing with their uh, obstacles and their issues. So that's their own personal battle. That's something I've learned growing up through the years as well. Like, like you said, we can't fix these people. Mm-hmm. You know, we can show them the way, guide them, then it's, it's you, you know? I think a super, you've done it yourself already, but I'll try and explain it in my own, my own words. A super powerful tool that you've utilized in your life, and your life has been yeah. far more, you know, oh. tragic than mine and, and a lot of people in the world, but you've utilized what we I call like a lens, as in, your outlook on the situation has always been to frame it in a positive light rather than to frame it in a negative light. So if you're at home and you're, you know, depressed or you're struggling, look at your life and think, how can I look at this in a positive light that I can improve it rather than looking at it as in life's so hard, it's not fair, you know, because you, you are, your upbringing where you've been was not fair, it was difficult, it had all these challenges that you had to overcome, and if you would have succumbed to, my life's not fair, it sucks, you would never have become the man you have become. But do you know what, Luke, I think one of the real reasons how I, I had that mindset was, again, you know, even though some people have amazing influences as parents, but the parents shows, it's their job to show them the walk of life, mm-hmm. to learn from the mistakes. But also, we we self-develop and all those children sometimes then also don't become authentic and still listen to their parents as they've grown up that's because they had they done it their way mm. now I didn't have that you know when I was growing up when I was growing up I was not influenced by many I had good foster parents but then I was away traveling I was living in Sheffy for five years so I was learning I was making my own decisions so when you have people these days complaining victim or complaining about things, it's usually because they've been brought up in that environment. It doesn't mean they've had a bad environment, but they've been around their mum or dad who's been, oh, it's work is hard today. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. So it's copied behavior. Mm. You become your parents. And again, this is why it's so influential. For me, if I ever had children, the first thing I do, I say, go and travel. Straight away. Now, do your education and go back and travel. And then you get to know who you are. I don't want to be that parent who, you need to do this, you need to do that. Of course, I'd be like saying, you know, make good decisions, guys, you know. <laughs> you know, be positive with that. But again, 
I'd be influential to do positive things. It doesn't matter what they do, but go and find it for yourself. Learn who you are. I think making decisions, mm. like you said, asking people to make decisions and then making those decisions and then seeing what happens from making those decisions exactly. is, is, is how you build confidence. Mm. I believe confidence stacks over small wins. Yes. So if the small win is I'm going to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go for a run, it's not that difficult to wake up at 6 in the morning and go for a run. So when you wake up at 6 and you go for that run, you come back and you feel like, I said I was going to do that thing, I did that thing, and now I feel proud. Yeah. And that those small little things, you then continue to do them, and then you become a bare knuckle boxer world champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you've, exactly, you've done that for yeah. years and years and years and years and years, and now you're the most confident man alive because you've done all these, had all these small little wins. Mm. So I think... Like you just said, people that listen to their parents that get stuck in this trap of becoming them and having victim mentality, yeah. just make a decision and stick at that decision. Yeah, yeah, Whatever yeah, that yeah. decision is going to be, if you're going to choose a different route, if you're going to go to a boxing gym, if you're going to go play football, whatever you decide to do sport-wise, but make a decision and then stick at that one thing for a long period of time. Cool. And when you're young, you, I, I was that kid. Mm. You know, someone tell me to do it, like, nah, <laughs> do, I want to do it this way. <laughs> Right or wrong, I learn. Doesn't matter as yes, long as you made I the decision and you decision, did it. Hundred percent, and I totally understand where you come from, and, that, and that's exactly what happened as me growing up was that, like, of course I listened. I, I always listened, you know, and I give respect, but like, my mind would work differently. So if I felt like this was the better decision, and it outweighed the other one, I would make the decision that was right for me. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's what, what it's about. I think you know, with, with a generation of two thousand and twenty-three now. I think what you said, Luke, is that we have too many people given the wrong influence um, of being something that maybe that they're not. You know, like when I look at you on your Instagram and I see you in person, you are that person. When people see me in my, in my fight and they see me every day being that person, today we have many life coaches, same way therapeutic, spiritual, in the out sniffing the heads off three times a week, partying, and then saying that they have in... Um, What's that word that's driving me mad at the minute? A whole wholesome week, uh, day, you're up to the fucking lake. A wholesome day when you've just been to the fucking party med off the night before. What's that mean? But again, do you see what I mean? The, from young children looking up to these role models that they say they are, but then behind the scenes they die. So instead of pretending to be something, don't, don't be that person. Just be authentic. Be honest with yourself. Build to that. It takes time yeah. to be that person. No, we what we are on our Instagrams and our fighting career. That has not happened overnight, Luke. That's took us fucking 20 years. Mm. I think that's the thing that people now, everyone wants an instant fix, right? Yeah. Everyone wants something instant. And they look at, like you said, they look at you or they look at me or they look at these influencers and they see the lives that these guys have. No, I want that. How do I get that? Well, you get it from struggling and fucking going through hardship for 10, 15, 20 years. And when you've done that, you can then start to reap the fruit and reap the rewards and be that guy and have the, the, the traits that are built over time. You know, and, and still that's not, at the end of it, that's still not guaranteed. No, of course. Do, do, do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> when I look today and when people, people are complaining, I want this life, I want that. I, I understand now as a person that I don't understand. I, I, before I used to understand how they think like this. You know, you know like, am I missing something? <laughs> you know? And now I don't look for that answer. I don't need to look for that answer. That's something that I could never change. That's, they, are my, they, they are just that. They, every, these are the people who want all these lovely things but still complain about life every day. Mm -hmm. Or complain why they haven't got these things. And we all know why they haven't got these things. It's because, again dedication and hard work and sometimes the hardest person working working man in the room is not always the smartest I've learned that as I grow up as well mm -hmm. and that's only due to experience but don't, you, you can't cheat the world it's, it's, it's as simple as that when it comes to life you can't build your real intuition by pretending to be something you need to build that yourself so when it comes to making real life decisions you can make good decisions then because you've been through these stages in your life and I think for me what's helped me in my life and maybe you and yourself as well, is the right 
the right influences. You keep talking yeah. about being the right influence, yeah. but having the right mentor or the right person or the right coach. I was unbelievably fortunate. The gym that I walked into had the coaches that it had and the people that it had. And a guy called Nigel used to always say to me, I look forward to the day where you become a well-rounded individual. Because right now you're not well-rounded. You're on the, 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 the way, you know, he, and he, he would help me. Jenny. He believed in me, yeah. and he helped me. I lived on, I lived in his gym. He Love you. fed me. He did a million things for me. So it's like, but he could see what what I think being a good mentor is, is understanding that you can see the person where they are, but you can see where, what they potential. can Potential. The potential that they have. Yeah. And I think finding that mentor, for me, like I said, it was Nigel. There was a guy called Jack, a guy called John. There's been many. Right yeah, now yeah. I've got others. Blessed, man. It's like... Finding that is the most important thing. And the best way to find that is to search for people that live the life that you want to live. You yep. know, that are living that, that, that reality, that authentic, who are authentic, yep. that are living the dream that you want to live. Like if you want to be a fantastic boxer, you get coached by a guy who knows how to coach fantastic boxers. Yep. Otherwise, what's the point? Yep. You know, there's, a, there's that phrase that says, if you want to learn how to punch, if Mike Tyson te- teaches you how to punch, you, you're going to learn how to punch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but you want to look at in all assets of life, people that, you know, if you want marriage advice, if you meet people that have got good marriages, it, it just, you want to gravitate you, you, towards you, those people. You're speaking people. to people who have exactly that experience. And this is why, yeah. again, you're doing the podcast to build, for you to other sports in, or, or that you haven't had a chance to dig into to give you that information. And mm. like you said, it's, when it comes to a topic then, you, you understand exactly a little bit more on, on that conversation. For me, it's, I'm doing this, I had a, another guest on last week and yeah. it's like, he said it perfectly. I've moved through life picking up information. Yeah. Everything. Every person has, every conversation I have, you said about value exchange, energy. For me, I only want to deal with people that are going to add to my life. Yeah. So every conversation I have in my life, it doesn't matter who it's with, is adding to my life. Otherwise, I don't bother having that conversation, yeah, right? Yeah, so that I'm, I'm walking through life and people are adding, people are adding ideas, things, thoughts, experiences, and I'm just storing the ones that I believe are useful to me. Yeah. And the ones that I believe are not useful just get thrown yeah, away. Of course. So I'm just moving through and I'm just collecting treasure. And this treasure is these experiences and these opinions and the, these things that people do to try and improve and enrich their lives. And by doing the podcast, I get to do that again with you and your story and the, the, what you've been through and everything that you've gone through to now be who you are. I will learn from that lesson and I'll pick little things and I'll put it there and I can then enrich my life with it moving forwards. Mm. You know, if you can, again, my upbringing was fantastic. I had no, beautiful no, no, parents, no, no, everything no. else. If you can go through that, that, those hardships and those mm. troubles, it just shows the character of the man that you have. And what I always say with these guys who are out there who want to achieve things you're achieving, things I've achieved and other people, they look at the thing. You know, they look at the world champion. I want to be a world champion. Cool. But the only way you could possibly become a world champion is if you go down this path of self-discovery mm. and, and investing in yourself to build yourself and into the man that is capable of becoming that world champion. So rather than worrying about being a world champion, why don't you worry about turning up at the gym every single day and trying to train four days a week? If you start with the basic mm-hmm. and you build the four, the four, four, times a, four times a day training every day of the week, then maybe you'll become a world champion. But if you just think about being a world champion, if you think about the destination, you're never going to get there because you're not doing the taking yeah, the steps. You, 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 you also know? understand that something's going to knock you off then. Yeah. So you haven't built resistance yet. To build resistance, like you said, you need to do those five things. Mm. If you even think about being a world champion. Yeah. Like, and again, I think that's just something that maybe I think me and you, even though you found resistance in your training and the uh, environments that you put yourself in the fight world, and I've had that for my life and in the fight world. So for me, I got shown resistance all the time. And I didn't break. You know, my, I just got stronger and stronger. So that band I feel right now is unbreakable. And I'm not lying to you. Uh, over time, uh, these last three years, I used to think, how did, not, how did my mental health stay together? Mm. And I look back and I'm thinking, I always self-check first. If, I was, if I'm in a situation, I look at me before I blame others. Mm-hmm. And... Or if I didn't at the time, I'll go home and do that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, and I look back and I think, you know, how did, not, how did my mental health stay intact? Well, how am I thought negatively? Why am I always thinking positive all the time? And I'm, I'm not kidding you, right? It worries me sometimes. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, like, I, I, I don't. I'm always so positive. It's not a day. If I've had a shit day, I'll find something positive in that day to make it a fucking great day. And I don't get why I'm like that. I can't blame my past. I can't blame the, the people around me because even before I started boxing, even when I was in a good foster home, I was still a happy, even when I was going through the shit as a kid, 
I still went to school happy. It was, it was mad. And I just thinking, I'm going to have a shit day today, but I'm going to go to school happy. <laughs> I went to school fucking happy. I'm going to have a fight today. <laughs> you know? uh, but I don't know. I just feel like I'm, I'm just continuously feel like I'm blessed that my mental health has stayed intact. I think a good way to process anything is utilizing your body. No, I, I, I'm just going to go like from drugs and alcohol, no parents, to go into all these hostels and homes, the abuse, the things that I saw, then building, trying to build a new family with a million different families. Mm. And then, you know, my foster dad passing away. Mm. And then my boxing coach, and then he passed away. You know, and then qualifying for the Olympic Games, need, need to qualify for the 2012 Olympic Games, and then I'm in a motorcycle accident. Then I'm in a divorce. And I'm still here. <laughs> you know, I just think, you know, uh, I also accept this is not where I wanted to be in my career because people see me such as um, as a, a, an artist in my box in the boxing world. They see me, the skills I can produce day in and day out. It's not luck. It's something that I've taken me 20 years to do. Like, why do you need to turn pro? I've accepted that. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was hard because I knew I could have been a world champion with the gloves on and that's where I wanted to be. The main goal first before that, I wanted to be an Olympic champion. But I proved myself I could do the five steps, like you said. Mm -hmm. Turn to the gym, I could be consistent. You know, champion mentality first before even being a champion mm. you know it's easy to be a champion but are you are you the things before that mm. you know so when it comes to now and i still get asked this question 24 7 like why do you turn pro like i'm 32 years of age so i know the process of me turning pro before i even have a chance to win a british title last two years because of politics mm -hmm. and i've got time to fight 10 journeymen i can sell 500 tickets with my eyes closed mm -hmm. i've got organic following you know, I sell myself, I say fit all you know, I can fight tomorrow if you ask me to fight tomorrow. I'm a promoter's dream. But it still take me two years to win a British title. That's 10 to 15 grand. That's not even minimum wage. Mm. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? So I've accepted that it says it's not going to happen. I, I, I'm realistic to know that if I turn pro, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. In three years' time, I'm going to slow down. I'm not going to be my best. I still, I could fight for another five years because I look after my body. But I understand I'm not going to get what I want to get. Because mm -hmm. when I'm in, I'm in. Yeah, you're not going to become world champion as a player. <clears throat> as, as a glove pro. I know no. it's, it's impossible. Because mm -hmm. of the, the time, the age. Mm -hmm. And if, if I had an investor, I got maybe a 50% chance. That's mm -hmm. not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, it's, this is when I realized, and it can I be the baddest Ben that will fight on the planet? And I said, I can do that. I can, I can do that. I'll work. You know? So that's why what this is the answer to everyone who, who asks me this question. Why am I bare knuckle fight? It's because of that reason. But I hundred believe, hundred percent believe, I can still be the baddest bare knuckle fight on the planet for the next two years. No problem. Well, let's bring it to that. <coughs> bring it to the bare knuckle world because I know zero. Yeah. Never even seen a fight. Never. I've seen highlights. Yeah. Never been ever <coughs> a fight. What is BKFC, BKB? What are the, you know, I know that, but how, no. how, how's the the map look? No, it's great. Um, we are the UK version. Okay. And we've been established before BKFC. Then Americans come along, which they do everything bigger and better, to right. be fair. And they've invested a shitload of money into it. And they've got a fantastic foundation. And they've grown their sport fast because of the investment. So which one's, which one's America? Which one's England? BKFC is America. BKFC. Ben yep. Apple Fine Championship. Yep. Yep. And then BKB is uh, the UK. Okay. But they both broadened. Now they've gone international. Okay. And BKFC have now come to the UK. But they're doing it just to piss BKB. But they brought in, because of the investment, it's smart what they've done. We want to see a sport where there's blood and guts. Yeah. No one wants to see boring fighting. Yeah. And everyone watches me, I'm boring. But I get the win. I don't care. That's the way I fight. I stick yeah. to what I'm good at. Yeah. Um, but BKFC invested. They're saying, do you know what? I'm going to pay you fighters, bare knuckle, more than you would get paid as pro glove. So, of course, they're going to take the fight. They've got families to feed. Yeah, okay. So, they've invested and built an amazing production team. And so, I'm going to pay double, actually, what we what you would get paid pro club. How can these fighters say no? Mm -hmm. Do you understand? This is why they get top names. they got top UFC fighters, top ex-pro fighters, or up-and-coming pros still, saying, oh, fuck pro, but there's too much politics in it. I'm going to go into this and, and be known as a fucking badass. I'm better productions. Mm -hmm. So... For me, is this is why I love the bare knuckle sport. You know, for me, is that when I'm going in there, I got these guys who think they fucking tough, 
I go up there on my little Indian skin and my Mowgli haircut and my blue eyes. I call myself Indian Spice. And they go up there and call themselves the Dark Destroyer and all that bullshit. And I go up there and I rip the arsehole out. Because you cannot compete with my 20 years. I know that. Like, I'm all about numbers. <laughs> you know, and numbers don't lie. So it doesn't matter what you've done. I've got 20 more years experience in here. So if you've got that luck, I'll give you that. I'll shake you out. You can't be that sweet nut shot. I say, do you know what? You got me that day. But out of 20 times, that would happen once. Do you know what I mean? And that's when, that's the confidence behind it as well. Um, so with the bare knuckle sport right now, it's just... It's growing really fast, and we are seeing a lot of blood and guts, and that's what people want to see. They don't, you know, you've got pro fights happening now, and people are booing halfway through the fight because yeah, yeah. nothing is happening. This is why UFC is one of the fastest growing sports in the world because there's one belt, the best are going to fight the best, and it's a five minute fucking round. So that's what I'm saying now with BKB and BKFC, which, which, which is the best belt? Well, the thing is, right now, is for me, is that I'm loyal. Uh -huh. So BKB have been with me from the beginning. And I've told them if they don't get me the big fights, I've had David Feldman, the owner of BKFC, do six video calls with me. Yeah. He wants me, like, he's, he's, he's offered to pay me triple the salary. Yeah. I've still got an eight-month contract with BKB at the minute. So I'm say, I'm, I said, I'm being loyal. I'm not going to burn my bridge anyway because I don't burn my bridges. He said, this is what they offered me. I'm going to show you. What are you going to do about it? Uh -huh. If you want to keep me, what are you going to do about it? So this, this, this is where we see. And then they got me the Ishii Smith fight. Uh -huh. So... Again, they pulled it out of the bag. And I said, you know, I don't care if she Smith is, you pay him more than me. Just get me the fucking fight. I want the best fights. I don't want to keep turning these idiots over. I want opposition. I want fighters who, who I generally want to go to the gym. I feel angry. I mean, mm. fuck, this guy can beat me, mm. you know? And I will get respect for this fight because he's a former world champion glove. Mm. And he's well known in the States. So for me, is these are the fights that I want. And where's that fight going to be? In London or two. Like, and it's September 16th. September right? 16th. Or put all of this underneath the, 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 the video as well. Top man. Um, what was I going to say? So, BKB, the only other bare knuckle boxer I know, again, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Like, ignorant coming into obviously the UFC market, but there's Rico Franco. Oh, we, I'm good yeah, fans. Yeah, your friend Franco is a good, good guy. Where's he from? Is he from Sheffield? He's Sheffield. from up around that area. I don't know where he's from. Yeah. We're good friends. I don't know where he's from. Um, so, where, where's Rico sitting the, again? No, well, he was, you know, he was with BKB and then he okay. signed with BKFC now. Okay. So and he's he gone on and done unbelievable. Okay. Uh, me and Franco are really good mates and he's he's like me. He, he, don't, he don't give a fuck. <laughs> he fight any man and he's always ready. He's got a fight and he's a great sportsman. He's not a dickhead. He does his talking in the ring. He doesn't do the bad mouthing. He goes, he, 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 he exploits himself with his actions, mm -hmm. not with his mouth. And um, I'm a, me and him are good, good friends and we always respect each other. Uh, and we were in the same tournament together as well. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, it, was, it was great. And, but again, he's a, like for me, it's not a, like being a prize fighter, you know, is, is a great name, but he's a warrior. Like, mm -hmm. man can fight. And his engine, you know, he's, he's, he's got a, 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 what do you call it, a bag? A flossomy bag, is that oh, what it's really? called? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. After yeah. that, straight back, f uh, three months later, fighting, mate. <laughs> Animal doing Iron Man's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's savage. Honestly, I go, I, I watch his videos. I say, Fair play, I say, Frank, and he, we, we speak back and forth all the time. And uh, but yeah, I got full respect for that man. Oof. Oh, oh, yeah. Last question because we'll, we'll, we'll be going for a while. Um, I, when I was fighting UFC early days, early not even UFC amateur days, yeah. fighting cage fighting, um, it wasn't very well known, mm -hmm. people didn't like it. If I said, what would you do? Oh, I'm a cage fighter. So how do you deal with, if someone says to you, oh, what do you do for a living? And you say, I'm a bare knuckle boxer. <laughs> uh, what, what's the normal reaction oh, you get? Oh, God. I, oh, I, to be honest with you, the way I am outside of my personal life, I like to be in the room, but I don't talk about boxing uh, yeah. or fighting. So, but when it does happen, and they ask me what I am, I just say, I'm a boxer. <laughs> I hate saying it. I like because they just think I'm a thug, like you yeah, know. Exactly, but I, exactly. I love. But to be fair, most people know, and they see me more. That they don't see the bare knuckle. They see the hard work and dedication because mm -hmm. they always see me training. They always see me uh, uploading on my Instagram and my socials. But when people do ask me, I say, "Yeah, I'm a bare knuckle fighter," and they go, "Okay," and they and then they do their research, and and then they go, "Wow, fucking no gloves on." I said, I, I say, yeah, I break my hands the first round every fight. <laughs> I can't hold my coffee for three months after, you know. 
Uh, and then it's more of the, uh, the intrigued and they want to know things that like, like why bare knuckle and what's the difference? And they ask me, a lot of people ask some good questions. You know, sometimes I do a lot of Instagram lives because I have a, such a, I have a fantastic following with the Instagram. And I like to give back. You know, if people are following me and they follow my journey, just chat. Yeah. You know, it's, it's great. It's a great way to interact with your fans. And um, but I also show them the, hum the, the humbleness, mm -hmm. you know, that I can be that person, but outside of my life, I'm not that person. You know, it's more to damn than just fighting, like. So for me, is I've built enough life experience to be more than just fighting. And that's what I'm more proud of is I built that through my life experiences that I know that if boxing is over, that's not the end of me. Mm -hmm. There's more to damn than just fighting. Because you look at the sports stars over the years where, where the career's ended and then they turn to drugs and alcohol or got obese or end up taking overdoses because all they were was that sport. Mm -hmm. And without that anymore... They feel like they, they're useless. Like, I remember watching a podcast with Mike Tyson, and he was like, he was upset, he was crying, and he was like, I sometimes I just wish I was that man again. I might the, the baddest fight on the planet. And then he goes, No, I don't. I, I, I actually don't wish I was that guy anymore. And that really set the tone of me, and I think, and he's right, like, I know we're more to us than just that. Mm -hmm. You know, we are humans, we have arms, legs, eyes. When people say things, it hurts us. And as men, we don't show that. But I think, again, when we talk about mental health, suicides, masculinity. In sport, we don't show no weakness. It's, it's absurd to show, absurd to show that weakness if you was a sport, uh, if you're into sport, because that was a, that was a sign that, that maybe you're beatable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially combat sport. Especially combat sport, you know? So, but the fact that I, I'm, I'm, I can show weakness now and vulnerability, I'm so grateful for because I can be in a room full of nobodies or anybody, it doesn't matter who it is, and I can show weakness and vulnerability. And if anybody thinks that's a sign of weakness, shame on you. Because mm -hmm. that shows me how weak you are. Because I know that you can't show that vulnerability. But that's me at my strongest, because I can show that. Mm -hmm. I can talk about things. Like in, the, in the beginning of the course, I got a little bit upset. But I can talk about it. I can express my feelings on that. And I think for men, I think, you know, when we come to friendships and relationships, that's what we don't do enough is we communicate, <laughs> you know? You know, we, we hide our feelings. We hide emotion. The only ever time you'll ever show that is around your children, usually. Mm -hmm. Or your wife might see a glimpse of that because she expects you to be the man of the house. I get that. Mm -hmm. But because a man cries or gets upset doesn't mean that he's weak. Far from that. You know, uh, I think men need to understand that it's okay to show that. It doesn't mean you're going to be a fucking crybaby, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm on about when it comes to friends, families, and things that happen in your life, it's okay to show that you're disappointed. It's, a show, it's okay to show that maybe uh, maybe a special moment in your family that's got you upset because you got overwhelmed. That's okay to show that. Fuck, you know, you know, we are human beings at the end of the day. Well, I think the true strength is shown when you can embrace every emotion at its fullest, right? 100%. So if you can embrace sadness, loss, disappointment, and you can show that, and then you also embrace the big moments when you're winning your hands in the air yeah. and you, everyone thinks you're the man. If you can embrace all of that, that shows true character and yeah. true strength. You know? And I think that's what I am in my career now where I feel so privileged I can even just sit here and talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And this only happened uh, after I won my world title against Sean George and I thought I had a guy from fucking was BBC or it was a big channel he said, Dan, he was a, he was a reporter, a journalist. And he said, uh, apart from the fight, I want to talk about your life. Mm -hmm. So we met up in Bath. It was like a 12-hour journey in the van. And on the way up, I cried my eyes out like a, a bawling baby because I knew I was going to talk about it. I hadn't talked about this in years. Mm -hmm. I'd done little glimpses. I talked about him, about my part, about foster care, etc. in little podcasts, after our interviews after the fight. But I thought, I need to go all in on this. All in. I mean, I'm talking about things that in my personal life that I haven't told anybody, not even my wife, my ex-wife. I talked about things in this interview that nobody knew. I'd done it to a stranger. And I thought, I got overwhelmed. I was, I was thinking what I was saying. And when I'd done the actual interview, he was, he was writing in an encrypted writing. It was not like normal. He was writing as like a certain script. It was like certain symbols. It was amazing. He's a proper journalist. 
And I did, it was, just, it was six hours. Six hours, I sat there, and I talked about some fucking deep shit, like, and I was like, and after that, I don't know what, it was mad, the whole cloud just was like, yeah. and I needed to do that. And after that, I felt so much more open to talk. And I started doing work at the time when I was home with fathers who had lost their children through drugs and alcohol. Mm. And I started doing talks around schools. And obviously in schools, there's got to be a certain borderline what you say, but I started doing eight-week courses with dads who had got th- were going through drugs and alcohol and they lost their children. Or they on the brink of getting them back, but one more strike, I think, was, was going to be a, a long journey. And it was amazing. I got, in one session, one of my sessions in 45 minutes, I got more information out of them in 45 minutes than the journalist had in two years <laughs> because I could talk about the details. The details that you, you you don't know those details unless you've been through that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it's just where I am right now and, and being able to talk and come on podcasts and speak to people like yourself and be read so open about it. I just feel really privileged about that and just thank you for today. Appreciate it. Well, I think I think that's, you know, from hearing the story, I think it's unbelievably important that you do it and that you mm-hmm. talk about it and you tell people where you've come from to where you are, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, because as you said, it inspires so many people and people understand it. And I, myself, I have much more respect is the wrong word, but respect for you. And, I, you know, like you said, I, I vibe on you on a completely different level and, and I yeah. connect with you differently. And everyone watching this will as well. I think I'd encourage you to do it more, to talk yeah. about it more. Even like you said, do the live Instagrams and all that sort of stuff. I think it's a super important message because I know young men and older men that are struggling with things and, and they need a release and they need yeah. a person to help them you know, get through it. And listening to your story could, could possibly do that. So I, I really encourage you to do, do that. So yeah, thank no. you for sharing it with me. I, I appreciate it. Um, so Dan, share exactly how people can follow you. They can get hold of you. Obviously, promote your fight as well. Again, the date, how you can see it, everything else. Uh, and we'll cut out and we'll chuck it at the bottom. Yeah, I fight on September the 16th. Um, it's going to be London O2 Arena at the Indigo. And if anybody wants a ticket, just drop me a DM on my Instagram. And it's Dan underscore Chapman underscore zero one. And I'll send you the ticket link. It's, it's, it's my biggest test. It's my biggest fight in my career. And for me, is I just love the support. For me, it's not about, you know, uh, winning, losing, or drawing. This is the place where 20 years of graft, I get to show people my skills. And I, I generally believe that. Win, lose, or draw. I've never been concerned about these things since my, on my last bare knuckle fights. I've just been loving expressing myself mm-hmm. with no pressure. There's no pressure on me. I'm the world champion. I don't care about the belt. I've never cared about the belt. I've just, I've always been privileged to see where I've come from, the obstacles I've achieved, uh, the obstacles that I've achieved that stopped me achieving the things that I wanted to achieve, and still here, showing skills that nobody can else can do in the world. And I just feel blessed I can do that and put on a show for everybody. So I just hope everybody tunes in and, and gives me that support. Perfect. I'm sure they're all, mate. Best of luck. Tom, cheers, mate. Thanks. Oh, thanks.